Our Earth is a rich planet, rich in the variety and multitude of images that adorn its surface. It is a carnival of color and form, light and shadow, shape and texture. A feast of scenes and pictures that touch our emotions, quicken our curiosity, and stir our memories. We who live on this planet hold our sight as the dearest of our senses. It provides us with the visual information needed to survive in a complex world, be it through a glance, a nod, a smile, or a fleeting expression. Our sight is the most precious form of human communication. Each day, the majority of data we require to live is received through two small miraculous machines, our eyes. There is a pool in central Jerusalem that is more than 2,600 years old. It is called Siloam and is the site of just such a miracle. The gift of sight regained. And as they passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no man can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated scent. And so he went away and came back, seeing, Here in northern Pakistan, 3,000 miles east of Siloam's calm pool, the miracle continues. Near the start of the Himalayas is situated Christian Hospital Taxila, where each year 12,000 people receive their sight. They are led by a friend or relative to a place they cannot see, believing that they will be able to walk home alone. It is the humble people who come to Taxila, to a modest Christian hospital in a country that is more than 99% Muslim, for here the legacy of miracles continues. Blind people being made to see.
12,000 people a year receive their sight at Christian Hospital Taxala because of people. People like Dr. Norval Christie. Since 1947, the hands of Dr. Christie have brought sight to more than 90,000 people. Modern Pakistan is still closely tied to the ancient India from which it came. It is a rural country of 90 million people, most of whom still live the simple lives of their ancestors. Here in rural Pakistan is a hospital that can rival the productivity of any corporation in Japan, Europe, or the Americas. For at Taxila, more than 18,000 operations are performed yearly with a permanent staff of only 86. 12,000 of these operations are cataract removals. And the hospital is almost totally self-sufficient on surgery fees that never exceed $20. For Zada, the journey to Taxila began in his small town near the Afghan border. Guided by the arm of a friend, he walked to the bus station, then traveled the 70 miles to the hospital. Those of us with sight can never know what the darkness of blindness is like, what it means to sit, waiting, listening, he cannot work or care for himself or his family. He can only wait, hoping someone will care to speak to an old, blind man. Dr. Narval Christie comments on the large numbers of patients that come to Taxila. The incidence of cataracts in northern India and Pakistan is higher than it is in the rest of the world. This is probably true, but nobody has the statistics to prove it yet. Uh, say this is true, more people have cataracts. The bigger factor in it is that there are less eye surgeons who are doing the eye surgery. Poor people find it very difficult to find a hospital where they can get their eye surgery done in a satisfactory way. There are eye departments in a number of government hospitals, but they have only a few beds and uh, there are thousands and thousands of people who have cataracts. It's estimated that two million people in Pakistan need a cataract operation. My name is Syed Zada. My father's name was Syed Akram Shah. I am Syed, a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. How old are you? Oh, I don't know, maybe 60 or 65. How many years has your sight been bad? Five years. It has been five years. Why did you come here? Everyone says Taxila is a first-class hospital. God has given them the cure for sickness. When you are cured, what will you do? I will work. I have to do something. My eyes will be healed. Do you want to get a new wife? No. <laughs> Who told you to come here? Knowledgeable people told me that I should come to this hospital. You must go to the Taxila Christian Hospital. You are a good man. If you go to Taxila, you may get cured.
I plead to you, I will gladly pay if you will operate on my eye. Please give me glasses that are right for me. Please tell me if you can do this, and if you are pleased, I will be pleased. I am just a poor man. Anything you want me to do, I am ready. Whatever you want, I am ready. Just please operate on my eye. If it is successful, you will be happy, and I will be happy. This is what I want. I am very poor. I must pray. I have nothing. I am an old man. What else can I do? If you will do this for me, if you will heal me, I will pray for you. Prayers are all I have to give. If you operate on me, I will have a second life. I will always pray for you. There are certain Muslims who would refuse to come to our hospital, those we do not see. But there are other very religious Muslims who do come to our hospital. We see priests in the clinic most days. I was up in northern Pakistan this summer at an eye camp, and we had among our helpers two Muslim uh, medical assistants who run dispensaries themselves. And they said, would you give us a few of these medicine bottles that say Christian Hospital Tax Law? Because the patients who come to us say, we don't want medicine you buy in the bazaar. We want that Christian medicine. They have great confidence in the fact that if they've come to a Christian hospital, they will be treated differently than they would be someplace else, and everything they get, on, get will be the real thing. They're not going to get a bottle of water. They're going to get a bottle of real medicine. Christian Hospital Toxilla started out in the spring of 1921 as a dusty, barren field. The land was purchased by the United Presbyterian Mission from no less than 23 separate owners, all of whom insisted on being paid in King Edward VII's one rupee coins. The founder of the hospital, Dr. J.G. Martin, personally transported two large sacks of rupees 14,222 of them, out to the site to pay each of the landowners. On August the 24th, 1922, Dr. Martin performed the first operation in a simple tent on the hospital property. During the rest of that year, 79 operations were performed, including 13 cataract removals. Although the early work began in tents, Permanent buildings were soon added, including an operating block, wards, and housing. The hospital grew from a treeless wasteland to a small medical oasis. By 1927, almost a thousand cataract removals were being done yearly. It is 7 a.m. Already, hundreds of patients and relatives have been waiting for more than an hour for admittance to the hospital. Entry to the hospital is strictly on a first-come, first-served basis. Due to the small staff and limited number of beds, only 300 new patients can be admitted each day. During high season, the total number of hospital patients swells to 1,500. These patients are cared for by a permanent staff of only 86 people. Sayed Zada waits with the others in the line designated eye patients. He has claimed his place since his arrival early yesterday afternoon. He camped in line with the other patients, sleeping there overnight. Sayed Zada has not seen a doctor, and at this point does not know if his blindness can be cured. He only knows that the blind are healed at Toxila, and he is here. After paying their admittance fee, the patients are brought to large waiting rooms in the clinic building to await their first examination by a doctor. Zada sits among the others and is among the last to leave the waiting area where he will at last learn if his blindness is treatable. Each eye patient is examined in a long, dark hallway. They are diagnosed by Dr. Christie and a team of assistants. 
The design of the examination hall, which seats up to 70 patients in a single row, allows the doctors to move quickly from patient to patient. Speed of examination is an important factor, for over 200 patients must be examined within a three-hour period. As Dr. Christie examines each patient, he passes the diagnosis on to his assistant, who then records the diagnosis and treatment needed on the patient's chart. Finally, Syed Zada is examined. Right eye cataract nebula. Left eye cataract. Tomorrow, the cataract will be removed from his left eye. Syed Zada is then examined with a slit lamp biomicroscope that allows for a better look at the eye. The cataract is easily seen. A milky disc in the pupil, blocking light from the eye's retina. Syed Zada waits with the other patients scheduled for surgery tomorrow. Before tomorrow's operation, each patient must have his blood pressure taken and his eyelashes clipped. Female patients are attended by female nurses and male patients by male nurses. Although the ratio of men and women patients is nearly equal, women eye patients at the hospital usually suffer from a more advanced degree of blindness. Patience is an important prerequisite for anyone who comes to Christian Hospital Toxala. Due to the hospital's reputation, patients like Syed Zada show an amazing degree of trust and faith. Although he is in a foreign environment and unaware of each step leading to his operation, there are few questions and instructions are followed faithfully. In his pilgrimage toward sight, Syed Zada's medical papers are the most important possession he has. Because only one eye is operated on at a time, many patients come back for an operation on their second eye. This is the case with the patients on either side of Syed Zada, both of whom have returned for their second operation. Patient's day on surgery starts out with something I have never seen. Sometime in the middle of the night, the people on night duty go around waking up the patients who to, are to appear in surgery today. Today there are 224 of them. It is 4 a.m. Syed Zada waits outside the surgery building in the dark, waiting to be called. Inside, surgery has been going on for nearly an hour. Today's surgeons are Dr. Christie and Dr. Pramila Law. Mrs. Dorothy Christie runs the complicated logistics and record keeping for each patient. Accurate records are kept on the 15,000 eye patients who come through the clinic each year. In the pre-op room next to the surgical theater, Syed Zada enters. It is in this room that the surgical procedure actually begins. Here they are given their eye drops and local anesthetic for the operation.
From here, patients move into the operating theater itself and wait their turn on a long bench until they are moved to a waiting place on the floor and then ultimately to the operating table itself. Despite the fact that there are up to 30 people at one time in the operating room, and most of these are patients in their street clothes, infection is kept at an amazingly low level, less than one per thousand. Although time prohibits the doctors from scrubbing between each patient, a battery of autoclaves runs continually sterilizing the instruments. Infection rates in our hospital are just about the same as they are in American hospitals. Partly because we stay a little more aware of the fact that infections can happen. My favorite term about it is we stay terrified. We know it can happen to us. With hundreds of operations scheduled each day, every second counts. Even the process of putting the patient on the table is so streamlined that no table is left empty even for the shortest moment. As one patient leaves the table, another immediately takes his place. After surgery, each patient is delivered to the waiting relative outside, where he is carefully bundled up and returned to his ward. Now Sayyid Zada enters the operating room. He is led to his waiting place at the foot of the operating table. Sayyid Zara sits, his last moments as a blind man. After almost three years of blindness, Sayyid Zara waits for a three-minute operation that will return his sight. when everything is completely ready does Dr. Christie step up to begin the surgery. The operation begins with a delicate cut on the cornea of Zada's eye. The average length of an operation is two and a half minutes to three and a half minutes. In today's Western world, the concept of missionary service often seems to be an old-fashioned remnant of colonialism. Many Westerners question the service given overseas when needs are so great at home. Questions like this are somehow not an issue at Toxala. After the cornea is pulled back to expose the iris, Dr. Christie carefully removes the clouded lens with a Freon-filled tube called a cryoprobe. The cold of the Freon causes the probe to stick to the cataract, and the cataract is simply pulled free from the eye. Mrs. Christie offers the intraocular replacement lens to her husband. The lens is carefully placed inside the eye, taking the place of the removed cataract.
It is 7.35 a.m. The operation completed. Sayed Zada is now quickly bandaged. He has been on the operating table for a little more than four minutes. He was the 103rd operation for Dr. Christie this morning. Zada is hurried off the table to make way for the next patient. Outside sits his waiting friend. It is early the next morning. Dr. Christie is making the rounds of all the patients that were operated on the day before. Syed Zada's bandages are removed for the first time. the operation is a success. <laughs> First opening When sight is restored after years of darkness Often there are tears. When he came to this hospital, he could see the difference between night and day. He could see a hand moving just in front of his face, but he could only know it was a shadow. He couldn't count fingers. He couldn't see the ground. He couldn't walk alone. He couldn't see his relatives. He was blind. A fresh bandage is applied but the wrapping is carefully re-rolled to be used again. Disposable is a word rarely used in Taxila. Grandpa, can you see? Yes, he can see. And at that time... Veni Lekardal, public health supervisor, discusses her first impressions of the hospital. I was fascinated in some way of it, fascinated of the kind of spirit they, the staff have, although working from early, early, early morning or more or less middle of the night, and still they would be ready to go out in the afternoon to vaccinate in some village, still being very cheerful and happy and uh, so on. Dr. Pramila Law has been at Toxella since she came with her husband in 1957. Since that time, she has performed over 70,000 cataract operations. But I, at that time, the professor of ophthalmology was Dr. Victor Rambo. And we used to go out with him, well, even as students on eye camps. And he had this habit, at the end of every operation that you assisted him, he would, would take your hands in his, in his own hands and say, Honey, your hands are made for eyes. And being young and I guess, you know, we Indian girls are a little bit well, emotional. Well, that went to my head and I said, Oh, if he says that my hands are meant for eyes, maybe they are meant for eyes. But I think he said it to everybody. But not everybody did become an ophthalmologist, but I ended up becoming one. And why the people come here, you asked? I think it's just a reputation that the hospital has built up over the years from the good work that has been done by the surgeons before us. And since we have been able to keep up the good standard, 
instead of the reputation you know going down and people not coming it's just built up over the years that we have to control the numbers because if we really had to see the whole clinic we would have over a thousand patients and if we had you know a thousand patients to see we would have have over in about 800 cataracts for one morning and that's impossible to do well i generally you know will calculate my speed about 30 an hour is my average I can go, well, in my youth, I think I went up to 48, but that was only once, I think. It was a big list. So according to the list that I had, I'll start at 4. If it's less than 110, I'll start at 4.30. So, well, according to the list, will I, will I plan the time? And most often, then, we are through by 7.30. Well, the rest go and have their breakfast. And I go back home and get some of my household chores done before I go on to clinic. In this country, a woman is, I mean, I've been known as Mrs. Lal, but I mean, but nobody believes that a woman can operate, especially in ophthalmology. You can do gynae obstetrics, but not ophthalmology. So, though I've been operating for so long, the credit has always gone to my husband. It was the Dr. Sahib, you know, with Dr. Lal, who was operating on them. So, the other day while I was doing rounds, it happened that I was operating with Dr. Friesen on his day, on his surgical day. And this patient got operated on by Dr. Friesen. But he said to me, I came with the idea that I was going to be operated on by Dr. Lal. And he said, all the women in the theater who were there with me, the other patients, they were all offering prayers for Dr. Lal, for his health and for his well-being. And here I ended up being operated by somebody else. But I, I'm fine. But he said, will you do something for me? With your hand, put a drop of medicine in my eye, and I know I'm going to be fine after that. Dr. Ernest Lal has been medical superintendent of the hospital since 1966. In addition, he is general surgeon for the hospital. My commitment to Christ in 1952, and that's the time I decided that I'll have to work in some mission hospital. And this is the mission hospital we came to. So we, there was need here, Dr. Christie was all alone. And uh, we were three of us for many years. And there are no other Pakistani doctors. So we just had to stay. In fact, from England, we had to come back because Dr. Christie had to go and furlough. And there was nobody else to cover for him. But there again, it's my husband who's the dedicated one. I don't think I'm that, that good. So he said, no, if we're going back, we go back now. Or you're not ever wanting to go back. You won't want to go back. You'll stay here. I mean, with just one person, well, my second son was born in England, so I didn't work at that time. But we had ample money, well, with just his salary. Had a nice house to live, had a car, and had everything we wanted. And But he said, no, this is the time now to uproot. We couldn't but we can't stay here longer, so we came back. In this hospital, we don't see special patients. Neither we see private patients. All patients are seen as they come, first come, first serve. And that is very hard in Pakistan for people to realize and to observe because they always feel they can get by by money or by safarish, by some asking somebody. But here we try to observe that rule and very strictly. And because of that, our service stays for two or three. Otherwise, the rich will come and pay money and be seen and go. There was this uh, civil judge, a retired civil judge, and he came to this hospital and he heard the same thing. And he thought, this is all nonsense. He will be seen. So he tried giving money, trying to be seen uh, as a special patient, then as a private patient. But then uh, he didn't get seen. So he stood in the line with other 300, 400 patients, got his chit made, and was seen, and he went home, and he wrote this letter. I have a letter in, uh, in file, and which he appreciated, given one, one place in Pakistan where they do what they say, and not just uh, say for saying sakes. See, here if you come, you have to spend two, three hours. You have to stand in the line to write a chit, you have to stand in line to be seen, you have to stand in line to pay the money, you stand in line to get medicine. So it takes about three, four hours. So only the poor patient has their time. But because of that, 
rich people don't come. We are all the time being pressed to see the rich. But we have avoided that. And we will avoid that as long as I am at least here. <laughs> so I don't know what will happen after that. Mrs. Dorothy Christie discusses the events that brought the Christies to Pakistan. So that's, I suppose that's what, again, drew us to this, this corner of the world. We knew the, he knew the needs. And then in, in 47, um, we were planning to be married in 48. But the Lord changed those plans too because partition took place in 47 and they needed help for refugees. And they wrote to our mission board and asked if they had anyone they could send out for medical relief work. And Norv was, had already applied to the mission, so they asked him would he go early, and he said yes. He wrote me a letter and said, I'm going to Pakistan, what are you going to do? So I prayed about that and went to see a close friend, and we talked and prayed about it. And I wrote him a letter and said, I'm going too. Here we are, still here. <laughs> came for six months and stayed for 60 years? No, not 60. <laughs> Norval always says he had the biggest practice anyone could have had. His first day in practice, he saw 50,000 patients because we we were on the road and the ox cart came along and we had to climb up on the ox cart, grab anyone we could grab and vaccinate them because there was so much smallpox in that group coming. So we'd just climb aboard and get everyone vaccinated, jump down, and get on the next one. It was, <laughs> it was fun. It really was. And yet we felt we were doing something. We originally came to Pakistan to take care of refugees. And we spent our first six months in relief work. Then we were asked if we would come to work in the hospital in Taxila. We had signed up to come to India eventually. I had in mind getting three more years training before I came. But we, the need was here, it was pointed out to us, Taxlin needs a doctor. You go to Taxlin and see what the needs are and help there and then you'll know what kind of training you need. And I came here and found that there were 900 cataracts to do. It was obvious I needed to get some training in ophthalmology. It was just poor people looking for a new home and it, that was just sad just sad you can't you can't believe it. well we can now I mean, we've got all the the afghans coming down here now that's like 1947 all over again less than one percent the hospital staff is almost entirely yeah, made up of christian point, believers no small feat in a country that is less than one percent christian dr lal discusses the spiritual ministry of the hospital well the service here is does affect them they go back. Something in their heart that there is somebody who is doing something not for money. And why he is doing it, they have to find out. We got a lot of requests, letters, requests, inquiring about Jesus and his, and his life. We sell literature, something like 30,000 rupees a, month, a year, Christian literature, which many other hospitals have stopped giving because they are afraid. But we haven't stopped. Many other hospitals have stopped uh, open preaching. We have stopped. But people never object. Because as a Christian community, we know, well, we know what we have to face. But, but, yeah, but yet we are thankful that we can preach the gospel openly. And there is no, lim I mean, there's no restriction on our worship or preaching or praying with patients or anything like that. Well, the foreigners are not allowed to do it. Well, Dr. Christie doesn't do it. But, I mean, the Pakistanis are, are allowed. There is no open visibility. I mean, you don't see anything in the open that really you're having any influence. But I'm sure that we are causing some influence, and the people that come here for treatment are influenced by our ministry. Because I have noticed that several times in the operating room, if one of the staff will forget to pray with the patients, one of the patients who've been here before for his first time will remind them, aren't you going to pray with us? And maybe, well, they put up their hands this way, the way they pray. But I mean, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and there are others who come and sometimes you say, well, there's nothing you can do. It's absolute glaucoma and you're gone. I mean, there's nothing we can do to get your eyesight back. And they say, 
will you do it? And we know that your Lord can, well, can cure us, can, you can give us healing. But we have to say, no, I mean, there are certain things, well, the Lord can do it without surgery too. So when we, I mean, he has given us the understanding and the wisdom to know what should be done, what shouldn't be done. So that's how I believe that we have influence. And several of these are secret believers that go back from here. I think the Lord has, has the place he wants each one of us. And when we find that place, then we know real joy. I've gone through this with young missionaries who've come out, some who have been very unhappy. And I maintain that if you're where the Lord wants you to be, you'll know his joy. That doesn't mean you don't have problems. Of course you have problems. But through it all, you know that, that he's right there. I think as a Christian, this is a reward anyway. If you work where God wants you to be, and I think he has a plan for every, every Christian's life. So then I think that kind of a reward from, you know, you are satisfied. If you know that you are where God wants you to be, you are satisfied and you are happy. And I think they feel a team spirit too, when they see the statistics and so on, and they know too that we did so, we did so, and so, we did so and so much this year. We did so and so many operations. We saw so and so man, many patients. I think they feel, they feel that we did it, a team spirit which I feel is quite unique for Taxila. And I think that helps a lot for people to stay. They feel a part of it. It's not only someone else's work. They are a part of it. It's we who make up Christian Hospital Taxila. I think that we have everything that we need in, in abundance. Money has never brought happiness that I know of. I don't know very many very rich people, but I don't think that, that the money they have is what brings them happiness. It's our family. We, we were thrilled with our, our family and the way they grew up out here. And they all love the Lord and they're serving the Lord in, in the places they are. They're all in the United States at the moment. But we, we still think that one of them may end up back here and another one will be going somewhere to the mission field. And that brings great joy to old parents' hearts. I don't know. I we're just this is just home. We're just very much at home here. We love the people. We love the work that the Lord's given us to do and the ability to to do it. What else does one need? Let me take off the bandage. I will tie it back. I came and did all that you asked. I believe in you. When I leave, I will be sad. The person who came from my town, I am obligated to go with him. Otherwise, I wouldn't want to leave. My friend came and brought me new clothes on the holy day. How many fingers? You can see, you can count. It's bright. There are tears in this eye. Try to walk slowly. Go straight. And this is the camera right over here. The bigger rewards, though, are knowing that you're in the place you ought to be. The Lord, Christians are quite certain, has a job for anybody who has a job for everybody in the world large percentage of the world doesn't bother to ask what that is. We, Dorothy and I, are sure that we're here because the Lord sent us here. And we stay here because he still wants us here. And it's rewarding to know that you're doing what you ought to be doing. God has given everybody a certain set of gifts, talents, abilities. Uh, I happen to have been born ambidextrous. 
nothing to do with me, nothing I could do about it, nothing I can take any credit for. Paul asked the people in Corinth, what do you have that hasn't been given to you? Well, that's the way it is. Anything you have has been given to you. If you stop to ask who gave it to you, the answer has to be God. Nobody, they may have sharpened up some of their abilities, but nobody made their abilities. And I happen to have found that I, the performing of eye surgery is one of my abilities. This is what God gave me to do. It's very rewarding to know I'm in the place where I can use this. God has a plan for you. He's given people abilities. He'll use the abilities you have, even if it's being left-handed. Happened to be made this way, too. I like the work. I suppose I'm certain I'm accused of being a workaholic. It happens to be fun. And there's chance here to do it. There's a job that needs to be done. If we don't help these people, if we don't cure their blindness, they'll stay blind. Any place else they can go.